Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is a new series we're creating, Tech Docs with Tomer. Uh, I am, uh, if you hadn't guessed yet, Tomer, uh, and I lead technical strategy at the Stellar Development Foundation. Uh, so this is both a new series and a new role for me. Uh, I've been working on the Stellar Network for quite some time, since 2017. Uh, and so I've gotten to work with all these great SDF engineers. And the general idea is to just share the things that we're working on uh, and hear about them directly from these engineers working on them. Today in episode one, we're going to talk about two big things, scalability and interoperability, uh, and specifically uh, two projects, Starlight and Starbridge. Um, and despite the name similarities, they're actually not the same project. Um, and we're also going to talk a bit about smart contracts and project jump cannon. So the engineer I've got with me today is uh, Lee McCulloch. Uh, Lee has been working very closely with me for the past three years. Um, I meet with them at least once a day. So this is um, uh, just another meeting for us. Lee, tell me a bit about yourself and how you ended up in blockchain and specifically SDF. Yeah, how I ended up at SDF is interesting. Uh, yeah, so I, I joined SDF in 2019, um, but that actually wasn't the first time I applied or I tried to work at SDF. Um, I actually reached out to Jed, I think, in uh, near the end of 2015. And, uh, you know, prior, prior to the Stellar Development Foundation, I was working at PayPal on the Braintree Payments um, card processing system. And... Uh, before that, working at Gumroad on um, payments for creators uh, who, um, you know, creating products, uh, selling products on on online. Uh, so, you know, you've worked on payments. Obviously, scalability uh, is a big topic in the world of in the world of payments and and decentralized payments uh, as well. Um, and you know, we're working on blockchains. We want them to replace traditional payment rails, uh, and that means reaching the same scalability goals of, uh, of, of uh, these other payment networks. Uh, can you tell us a bit, uh, maybe before we go into scalability and blockchain, uh, tell us a bit about scalability and payments in general. What types of numbers do people expect from these systems? Yeah, so I, I think like numbers vary a lot depending on uh, the payment use case. Uh, so, um, you know, visa, uh, systems like, you know, Visa, um, you, you, if you have a look at in the, in the news, you know, they'll throw around numbers like 24,000, um, transactions per second, um, you know, at a, at a peak or, um, and, but then when you look at uh, exchanges, uh, exchanges may be doing hundreds of thousands, um, uh, you know, claim, you know, their systems are capable of doing that at some sort of peak. I'm um, not necessarily sustainably though. So um, I think, yeah, when we talk about payment systems, there's um, sustainable uh, TPS or transactions per second, um, but then, you know, systems always want to be able to handle some scale well above, you know, what their just, you know, normal daily rate is. Interesting. So we hear a lot about different scaling solutions uh, for blockchains, uh, whether it's, um, you know, just trying to max out TPS on, on the L1 or things like uh, payment channels, things like um, you know, rollups uh, in other ecosystems. Uh, you've worked on uh, Starlight, which is a payment channels project. Uh, can you tell us a bit about, um, you know, just like what payment channels are and what's uh, unique about uh, Starlight? So, yeah, Starlight is a payment channel um, uh, protocol. And, uh, you know, most payment channel um, protocols uh, sort of work like a settlement process. So the idea is that um, you are trying to move as much uh, of the uh, much of the, uh, the the payment processing off chain and, and then trying to settle on chain. So what, what occurs on chain is a net settlement. Uh, so if, if you and I have a payment channel, uh, I can send you some payments, you can send me some payments. And then at the end of the day, one of us is going to owe the other person um, some amount of, of money. And then, so ideally, when you close that payment channel, uh, you know, whatever the that final owing amount is, either I, I owe you some amount or you owe me, we don't have to do all of the payments that occurred in between. We can just do that final one. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can, you can get tremendous scale with that uh, by, by just, you can just, you can have that payment channel open for a long time. And so the, the L1 network is not, um, is not doing a ton. Interesting. And how does that differ from uh, other 
um, you know, L2 solutions or scalability solutions like uh, side chains, for example, or rollups. Yeah, so I think um, all of these all, all of these different protocols all have uh, different trade-offs, uh, and they all have different trade-offs in uh, technology complexity. Um, you know how well battle tested, or you know how simple the primitives are that are being used. So payment channels are um, our example of a protocol that's using relatively simple primitives um, to do something interesting, uh, but then. The uh, pay, they're, they're really simple for you know direct one to one payment channels, but then you know there's some complexity and additional risks and problems to solve when we start saying okay we want to do like multi hop um, payment channel protocols or uh, you know full on networks like the Lightning Network, um, and, and then uh, uh, you know side chains I think are interesting um, and uh, they introduce another trade off and, and that's you know potential fragmentation so if you have um you know several side chains you know these communities uh, are sort of fragmented uh, and so um you know that that's that's like another problem to solve and then i think um roll ups are also really interesting and you know seeing them um develop in the in the ethereum ecosystem specifically um yeah is, is like fantastic to watch yeah I, i'll add to that that side chains are uh you know a lot of people talk about them as scalability solutions but it, it's kind of like just like throwing the ball down to like another blockchain and then you have to deal with scalability there right so uh there are like limited gains with side chains yeah i think i think what's what's interesting about side chains is that um you know in the world of traditional like yeah, traditional web applications when you're thinking about scaling them like sharding is a really common uh, pattern uh, you, you can usually find patterns in the data uh, that you know don't need to be accessed at the same time so you can um, you know divide up the data and you know have it being hosted separately and and that's uh, that can be a great way to you know horizontally scale systems um, but uh, with, with side chains, that's sort of that's sort of what you can do as well. You can sort of, I guess, break up your network use cases so that you have you know one kind of DeFi or happening on one chain and another kind happening on another chain. Um, but yeah, that fragmentation and that lack of interoperability, you sort of have to solve for that. And so I think you know we do see there are some ecosystems that are starting to develop pretty good technology for interoperability between chains, um, and that's really exciting. But that that you know there is still that fragmentation, and and I think. Another thing with sidechains too is that um, you know you can make a sidechain. You can address the fragmentation issue by saying that the sidechain maybe is trading off other guarantees. Uh, so maybe the sidechain can handle more volume, um, but it isn't providing the same security guarantees as uh, the main chain that is attached to. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just I guess another another trade off. Yeah, and we are seeing people develop sidechains for Stellar, things like Pendulum, things like uh, Flare are in the work. So, um, you know, a lot of interesting work there. And, you know, I was, I was referring to rollups earlier, and I think it's it's worth mentioning that, uh, you know, one thing that's great about the Starlight project and payment channels in general is that they really work with the Stellar network as it is today uh, with the existing protocol, whereas more complex L2 constructions like um, like rollups require a uh, amount of intelligence uh, on the network and things that we can't really do today, but maybe in the future uh, with uh, the smart contracts project uh, might be able to do these things. Yeah, I think the the Starlight project uh, it, it was sort of uh, it does involve making changes to the protocol. So you know, right now um, we've just started work on uh, implementing Cap 21 and Cap 40, which Starlight uh, needs. Uh, but you know those modifications to the network are very um, you know a, a sort of like small tweaks to the network. Uh, they're not like a massive um, massive change to the network. Awesome. Um, and if our audience is uh, not familiar, caps are core advancement proposals. Uh, these are uh, the mechanism in which we introduce protocol changes to the stellar protocol. Um, talk to us in uh, numbers. Uh, what did you uh, what do you see with uh, with the current Starlight implementation? Yeah, so under one configuration, we were able to do 1.1 million transactions per second, um, and this was. And then in other configurations, I think yeah, we have like 1.5, um, and then also yeah. So yeah, the and these benchmarks um, 
1.5 million transactions per second. Okay, so that's um, quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and th this was um, you know, that there were this this was between uh, two participants who were located in the U.S. So we, the one of the constraints of a payment channel uh, is you know the network latency between the two participants, um, and uh, so this was between two participants with. Um, you know, some small amount of latency and uh, the uh, Starlight in, in the Starlight benchmarks, we're employing not only payment channels, we're also employing um, this concept of buffering payments. And so that's where the two participants, as they're sending payments to each other, uh, they're not waiting for a response to confirm the, the um, sorry, they are waiting for a response to confirm the payment. Uh, and while they're waiting for the response for the previous payment, they're buffering up payments. Uh, and then once they get the response from the last one, they send all of those payments together. And then once, and then they continue buffering payments while they keep waiting for the, the response to each one. Right. And um, I'd say that that might be where your past experience in payments comes in because batching is nothing new in the world of payments, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you know, most payment systems uh, work on this, this, uh, uh, especially in the credit card or the card processing space, uh, work on the, the, yeah with the pattern of authorization and settlement. So you know authorization is something that's done in the moment to confirm. It's really you know validation. Does this is this card legitimately a, a card that that has a balance and and can we can we uh, lock in those funds? Uh, and then the settlement when the actual money moves between the banks and everything that happens later. And uh, depending on you know how what scale the institution is working at, you might be batching every hour or um, you know a couple of times a day or just once a day. And uh, yeah, so this yeah, you're right. this is this is like a really old school um, pattern to apply. So let's jump to our next topic, uh, one of my favorites, which is interoperability. Um, you know, Stellar was built as an interoperability layer between different payment systems. Uh, and, you know, I've spent my bulk time in the SDF since 2017 working on building up the anchor network, which facilitates this interoperability, uh, you know, between financial institutions. Uh, you've been working recently on a new project called Starbridge, which uh, provides a different type of interoperability. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I, I think um, you know what is what's great about Stellar is that we do that the Anchor Network is a really great solution for interoperability with traditional payment systems, and traditional payment systems are typically centralized, uh, and so um, you know the, the Anchor Network is a in integration into centralized systems. So Stellar is decentralized, um, but these other systems are centralized, uh, and I uh, Starbridge is is really addressing the issue of how does Stellar interoperate with payment systems that are decentralized? Uh, so other blockchains, basically. I think in, in that use case, uh, the you technically can apply the anchor pattern that we have, um, but you end up with a decentralized system with a centralized anchor in the middle and then a decentralized system on the other side. And so what with Starbridge we're attempting to do is um, to connect these two systems with a with a decentralized system, so that we maintain that trust, minimize connection all the way through from uh, from Stellar to another blockchain, which is pretty awesome. It means that I'll be able to uh, you know onboard, for example, in a USDC from the three hundred thousand locations around the world, uh, then move it uh, via this trust minimized bridge into like Ethereum, for example, participate in DeFi and in various other financial instruments, uh, and then head back to Stellar and cash out in a MoneyGram location, for example, um, which is, is pretty cool. So we've recently uh, announced smart contracts on Stellar, Project Jump Cannon. Do you think that will uh, change Starbridge in the future, or uh, uh, are we going to see um, uh, it, it's, is the current design going to last? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, smart contracts will change. They'll probably change a lot of things, uh, not just this, but, uh, you know, Starbridge, the design of Starbridge is really, I guess, based around Stellar's um, transaction model and, and what we can do on chain today. Uh, and when, once uh, uh, smart contracts are supported on Stellar, um, many other types of bridge designs will, will be able to integrate um, with Stellar. So a lot of, you know, th there are a lot of um, very interesting bridge projects 
uh, out there between uh, different blockchains uh, and in the blockchain space. And um, you know, any of those designs uh, that rely on smart contracts and other ecosystems will be able to, um, in theory, run on the smart contracts on Stellar. That's very cool. So you know, there seems to be a pattern here where um, you know, obviously, we have the current network, the current protocol. Uh, it's it's robust, but it has a very limited surface area for for uh, you know building trust minimized um, constructions on top of it. Uh, but you know, we're doing what we can with the current protocol and uh, in the future with smart contracts and and project jump cannon. Uh, you know, there's uh, potential to increase the surface area. So. Talking about Project Jump Cannon, um, I know that uh, you've also been uh, uh, part of that project and exploring some facets of, of smart contracts. Maybe you can give us a, a quick preview on what you're working on. I know this is very early on, and uh, you know I won't hold you accountable for anything, but uh, really curious about what you're working on right now. Um, right now, we're experimenting uh, with um, a WASM runtime. Um, in Stellar Core, and uh, we were experimenting with you know what it would look like to um, to connect uh, the the different capabilities that Stellar has today um, into that Wasm runtime, uh, and how you know that would be presented to developers to be able to write smart contracts. And so, um, what I'm experimenting with at the moment is um, a prototype Wasm runtime um, that. Uh, that the core team has been putting together um, to, uh, you know, for us to experiment with and really figure out you know, what the developer experience is like. And so um, part of that is experimenting with different uh, languages that can build um, WASM binaries, uh, or the WASM, WASM um, files, and uh, having a look at like, what's the developer experience gonna be like if, if I'm writing a, a contract in, in Rust and uh, you know calling into host functions to get access to data on the Stellar network um, and or you know and we're also having a look at other languages like you know assembly script Zig um, using TinyGo um, just trying to figure out yeah well, what's the developer experience going to be like and and thinking about it from a few different angles as well um, you know from the perspective of a developer who's already building smart contracts for another ecosystem uh, and then coming to Stellar, you know, what, what's their experience going to be like? How similar is it going to be or how different? Um, but then also having to think about um, how do we just generally make writing smart contracts safe uh, and, um, and, and really, really easy to do well. So it sounds like you've been experimenting with some, uh, how should I put it? esoteric programming languages like assembly script and zig um how do you feel about that do you think that will help folks coming into uh the pro the jump cannon ecosystem or is this um uh, a bit of a high threshold for entrance yeah i think that's i think that's a good question and, and there's obviously a lot of trade-offs here and uh, right now um the the work uh that you know we're a lot of the work we're doing on jump cannon right now is Experimental, you know, we're really trying to figure out firsthand. You know, uh, we don't want to talk, I think, just theoretically about these things. We want to get our hands dirty and, and really understand what's the actual experience. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a lot of chains that are using Rust, for example, um, with Wasm runtimes, um, and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, we're just trying to understand not only from the Wasm level, you know, which Wasm runtime you know, has the right ergonomics or the, the right capabilities that we need. Um, but just, you know, top to bottom, the entire stack, um, what does it all look like? And, and make sure that we have a firsthand concrete understanding uh, when we're picking, you know, these different uh, technologies. Sounds very exciting. And to our audience, this is a very uh, early in the process. So uh, Lee is not committing to supporting Zig and Project Jump Cannon. Uh, don't worry. Uh, awesome. That was great. Uh, a lot of great information. Uh, thank you, Lee. I really appreciate uh, you spending this time with us. Um, and that is a wrap for today. Mm -hmm.